law, Deuteronomy chapter 33, the second to the last book of the law. And we'll look at that in just a moment here. Deuteronomy chapter 33. While you're finding your place, I'll tell you something. We, we take this situation that we're in seriously and we don't want to make light of it. Uh, but I, I couldn't help but think uh, something I heard a fellow say many years ago, decades ago, really. Um, I know that people who have this uh, virus are extremely contagious, and I've heard that you can be asymptomatic. That means you don't, don't show any symptoms, but you could still be a carrier of the virus. And that's the reason for the abundance of caution and folks uh, staying clear of public gatherings and, and when we are out staying at a distance from each other and taking other uh, reasonable precautions uh, that any reasonable person would do. But I heard a fellow say years ago, and I, this true story, I heard a fellow say this, he said, uh, my wife does not have stress, but she's a carrier. <laughs> so <laughs> you can think about that. <laughs> but, uh, that. That wasn't my saying, by the way, I gotta, gotta clarify that. But uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. It says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. I want to emphasize the first part of verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. We sang our first hymn tonight. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Well, this is where that idea comes from. Uh, this verse and this passage, we're gonna look at it this evening. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we are here. Thank you for those able to be here, for those who are watching at home or other places or listening or maybe watching later on. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would use your word and speak to our hearts and touch us and enable us to receive exactly what the Spirit would say to the church in this hour. Once again, Lord, we pray if there's a soul listening who doesn't know you, may they put their faith and trust in you. And may your people, your children, those who have come by faith, may they be strengthened in their faith. And as we sang earlier, Lord, may they be able to claim victory in Jesus and know that the Lord is our shepherd. Father, we just pray that you'd help us to glorify you and to convey exactly the message that you would have. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back, if you will, to the 24th verse. What you have in Deuteronomy 33 is this. This comes, as we said before, at the end of the five books of the law or the five books of Moses. The word Deuteronomy actually means the second giving. It's the second giving, or it's a reiteration of the law. The law was given in Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, but there's a re repetition of the law here in Deuteronomy. But by the time we get to the 33rd chapter, Moses is at the end of his life. In the 34th chapter, we're told of the death of Moses. Now, he's 120 years old. And he has led the people of Israel for more than 40 years. And God's calling him home. So as he nears the end of his life, the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 33, verse 1 says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And so he blessed the 12 tribes of Israel. And he spoke a blessing on them. Uh, his final address to them, if you will. And it would be great if we were to look at verses 6 to 29 uh, and see the blessing he gives to each one. But for time's sake, we're just going to look at one of them. Let's go back to verse 2, if you would. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of saints, and from the, his right hand went a fiery law for them, the giving of the law. Yet he loved the people, 
and all his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. And Moses commanded us the law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun. Now Jeshurun is another name for Israel. And it means the, uh, the righteous one or the upright one. So he says he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Now that's the introduction. And then beginning verse 6 down through verse 29, there's the blessings of the individual tribes. I want us to look at the blessing of the tribe of Asher. When you think of the tribes of Israel, you think probably most of the tribe of Judah, the most prominent one. Maybe you think of Benjamin or Reuben or some of the others. Asher doesn't get mentioned a great deal. And yet, the final blessing in this chapter is given to the tribe of Asher, and it's a wonderful blessing. Now, before we read it, let me make something clear. This is a blessing that Moses spoke particularly for the people of that tribe of Asher. It was for them. But I think we can get some things from it for ourselves, and I think we can learn from it. Look at verse 24, if you will. And of Asher, he, Moses, said, Let Asher be blessed with children. You know, children are a blessing. They really are. I, I do not understand folks who reject their children, and, and some do. It's, it's hard for me to comprehend people rejecting their children. Children are a blessing from the Lord. The Bible says the... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to quote a verse there. It left me. Uh, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And that's, that's exactly right. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And we need to look at them of that. You know, children are God's way of saying that the world's going to go on. And children are God's way of giving us the opportunity of training the next generation and teaching them and loving them and introducing them to him. It is indeed a blessing to have children. And then in verse 24, Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Now that's an important statement. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Had the brothers, the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, had they always had peace with each other? No, they hadn't. Had the tribes themselves always had peace with each other? And the answer is no. And so Moses' blessing on Asher is that they would have, be acceptable to their brethren. You know, honest truth is we all want that, don't we? You want to be accepted by other people. You don't want to be rejected by other people. You don't want to be treated unkindly by other people. When you go out into public and you meet folks, you want other people to treat you as a human being and give you common courtesy. And when you get with your family, you hope for a little more than just common courtesy. I, I was with somebody in a business not long ago, and they were what I would call professionally polite. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, they were polite in as far as their business went, but that's as far as it went. There was no friendliness there. There was no real welcome there. They were just professionally polite. That's not what we're looking for. Do you want to be accepted? And Moses said that the children of Asher, the people of Asher, would be acceptable to their brethren. And then the last phrase of verse 24 might strike you a little odd. It says, let him dip his foot in oil. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like much of a blessing. You ever been around a garage or something, there was some oil spilled on the floor and you stepped in it and you, you didn't consider that a blessing, did you? <laughs> you said, oh my goodness, now I got a mess I got to clean off and that's not fun at all. Maybe you'd slip on it. It's not what it's talking about. It's not what it's talking about at all. First of all, let me share this with you. Golda Meir was the first, or not the first, but one of the prime ministers of modern day Israel. And she said this, she said, isn't it something that the Middle East is filled with oil and God chose to give us the one piece of land that has no oil? <laughs> well, you know, that's not entirely true. It's, she thought it was true. It seemed to be true in her lifetime. But you know, recently they have found oil in Israel. And so the entire Middle East, every country in the Middle East, as far as I know, has access to oil. But that's not the kind of oil that's talked about here. 
You see, oil in biblical times was a valuable commodity and it was traded. And you'll read in the Bible and in other ancient sources, you'll read about how they traded spices and oil as we would trade uh, stocks in the stock market today. Great ships would travel far to deal in spices and oil. They were very valuable, not only as flavoring for food, but also for medicinal purposes. And health uh, was enhanced by certain oils. And so when it says, let him dip his foot in oil, it's talking about let him be healthy, let him have a, a great blessing of health. Then in verse 25, he says, thy shoes shall be iron and brass, as in the days, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let's try that again. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. What it's talking about here is this. Maybe you're thinking, I, I wouldn't want to walk around with an iron shoe on, it'd be too heavy. Now, I, I'm gonna give you a personal illustration here. Um, I was, had taught my sons and my children and, and many other people for that matter uh, if you're kicking somebody to defend yourself don't kick with your toes why because you'll hurt your toe that's why <laughs> and you can damage your toe now I bring that up to say this some years ago my my son was in another state and uh, he was stationed there with the military and uh, he called me up one evening and he said dad I got a question for you I said yeah he said uh, you always taught us not when you kick, don't kick with your toe because you could hurt your toe. I said, that's right. He said, well, here they're teaching us to kick with our toes. I said, okay, now let me ask you a question. He says, what's that? I said, what do you have on your feet? He said, well, our, our, our boots are our combat boots. I said, okay, if you got combat boots on, you can kick with your toe, <laughs> okay? You're not gonna hurt your toe. Uh, some construction workers, other people wear steel-toed boots. Maybe you do, I don't know. Yes, wear steel-toed boots. If you got steel-toed boots on, you can kick with your toe. You're not gonna hurt your toe. You know, <laughs> the fact of the matter is most people aren't wearing combat boots or steel-toed boots, and so you tell them don't kick with your toe. Does that make sense? What does that have to do with this? Well, look at what it says here. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. May not be comfortable, you think, to wear shoes of iron and brass, but think about this. They're not gonna wear out. You're gonna wear those shoes a long time. And that's what it's talking about. Your shoes will wear like iron. Your shoes will wear like brass. You put iron and brass together, you get bronze. And the fact of the matter is, those shoes are gonna last and last and last. And what he's saying is, you're going to not suffer loss. You're going to prosper, you're going to endure. And in the next phrase, it says this, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now Moses knew what he was talking about there. Moses, as we said, by the time of his death was 120 years old. You know what it says? His eye was clear and his strength was as the strength of a young man. Now there are not many people at 120 that can say that. Uh, I'm not near 120 yet, uh, past halfway there, but, but I'm not nearly there. But the fact of the matter is, my eye isn't as clear as it used to be. That's why I have these, you know. Uh, somebody told me the other day that they, they wore glasses because they liked the appearance of them. I said, I don't. I said, I wear glasses so I can see. <laughs> you know? uh, if I didn't need them, I sure wouldn't be wearing them. But Moses' strength was as a young man, and his eye was clear, it says. And so he knows what he's saying when he says, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. What does that mean? As long as you live, you're going to retain your strength. What a blessing. Can you imagine? Up to the end of your life, you retain your strength. And then verse 26. He says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. There is none like unto the God of the upright one. There is none like unto the God of Israel. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun who rideth upon the heaven in thy health and in his excellency on the sky. He rides upon the heaven. What does that mean? It means God is the ruler over all. 
Well, I thought it meant that he literally rid upon, rode upon heaven. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that his, he has power over all of it. His excellency rides upon the sky. We, we ought to look up. Somebody called me on the phone one day. This isn't recently. It's been a while. I answered the phone, and somebody I knew, and they said, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He says, where is heaven? Now, I haven't been asked that question a great deal, but... Um, they, they asked me, and, and I realized it wasn't a joke. It was a sincere question. They said, where is heaven? I said, well, the Bible tells us that heaven is up. It tells us there are three heavens. There's the first heaven, which is the sky that we see, we look at, the atmosphere around the earth. The second heaven is the outer space, as we call it, or the rest of the universe. And then there's the third heaven. Paul talks about being caught up into the third heaven, and that's the dwelling place of God. But the person said, where is it? I said, you mean like geographically, where is it? Now that was the wrong term to use because geographically means on earth. But uh, they got what I meant by that. They understood physically, where is heaven? How do you get there? Well, the way you get there is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. But they said, where is it? And I thought again, I said, well, Psalm 48, one and two says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the beauty of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Well, if you look at a map, north is what? North is up. North is always up. Where's heaven? It's up. Up where? Up where you can't see it with your eye or even with a telescope. Up where you can't see it if you go out into space. One of the first Russian cosmonauts who went out into space uh, was out there and, and out in space and he radioed back to earth and he says, I'm out here in space, I don't see God. Where is God? And he was mocking God and he was saying, there is no God. I, God was to be found, surely I would find him out here in space. But somebody commented, commented on that and said, you know, all he had to do was take off his helmet and he would have seen God. And there's truth to that. Let me contrast that. One of our first missions that went around the moon and orbited the moon as they came around the dark side of the moon and came up into the light again. They radioed back to the earth as they saw the light coming again and they said, in the beginning, God. What a difference. What a difference in the point of view. You see, what we're, he's telling us here is that God is the king, the creator and the king of all the universe. And so there is none God like the God of Jeshurun who runs, uh, rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. And then in verse 27, he says, the eternal God is thy refuge. The eternal God. You know, everything in this life, everything on this planet is temporary, everything. There are things here that have been here for thousands of years. There are trees that are thousands of years old. Obviously, there are mountains that are thousands of years old. The seas are thousands of years old and have been the same for as far as recorded history can go. There are buildings. I've seen buildings that are 1,000 and 2,000 years old. An amazing thing to me about those buildings is not only are they that old and not only are they still standing, at least in part, but in some cases, they're still in use. That's amazing to me. And you see things that people built so long ago that people today, some of the greatest architects and some of the greatest minds today look at those buildings and say, we don't understand how they built that in ancient times. Now, I'm not pretending to know all about how they built things in ancient times. As you can learn a little bit about it if you'll study it. But here's what I'm willing to say about that. I'm willing to say that we need to understand that people who lived thousands of years ago were a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. They were able to figure out how to do these things. They weren't uh, 
see, we have this, this false idea that we are so much smarter and we know so much more than anybody who ever lived before us. Well, what if that's not true? What if people who lived 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, what if they were just as intelligent as we are? Maybe even more so. What if human beings have just always been smart? That would explain a great deal, wouldn't it? And I believe that's the case. I really do. So I think people figured out how to do what they could do with the tools they had to work with, and they invented tools. But even with that, even though that's true, everything in this life is temporary. Everything in this life has its beginning, has its end. Life itself has a beginning and an end. But then we talk about eternity. And it says, the eternal God is thy refuge. There are many gods, little g, in this world. How many? Well, there are thousands, perhaps, that some people say millions. Many of them. But which of those is the eternal God? There's only one eternal God. Now, the eternal God is the one who says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The eternal God is the one that says, I am the Lord, I change not. The eternal God is the one that says that I am past, present, and future. Eternal. The eternal God is thy refuge. God, the eternal one. The Hebrew there is Kadem Elohim, the creator who is the beginning of everything. Say, so, well, you say everything had to have a beginning and an ending. That's true in time. And we live in the realm of time, but God lives in the realm of eternity, and he is the beginning of everything. A couple of thousand years ago, one scholar put it this way. He said, God is the uncaused cause. Now you think about that, the uncaused cause. He is the cause of all there is. The point that I'm trying to get you to see here is very simple. The eternal God is thy refuge. You have the eternal God upon whom you can rely, who will defend you, to whom you can come. And it says the eternal God is thy refuge. And then it says underneath are the everlasting arms. Again, that's what we sang about in that first hymn. We sing that hymn often, and we should. It's a good one. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. But have you ever thought much about what that phrase means, leaning on the everlasting arms? The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. You don't exhaust the strength of God. You don't exhaust the strength of the Lord. When Lord Jesus was on the earth, we read how that he, he became physically tired. Why? Because he took on a human body. And he became physically tired, but never to the point that he couldn't help others. When he was on the cross, some people said that. They said he saved others. He cannot save himself. Truth is, he could have saved himself. But had he chosen to save himself, he would not have saved all mankind. They said, come down from the cross, if thou be the Son of God. But if he had come down from the cross, he would not have completed his Father's will. He would not have completed the purchase of our salvation. They said, call upon God if he is your Father. Jesus said before they put him on the cross, he said, he could call 12 legions of angels. Now, I've done study on the size of a legion, and if you go into the history books, you're going to find that legions varied in size. But it would be sufficient to say that a, the a legion could be as many as a thousand soldiers. So if you called 12 legions of angels, that would be 12,000 angels. Well, the old song says 10,000 angels. All right, let's say that each legion isn't quite a thousand. Let's say it's 10,000 soldiers, uh, 10,000 angels. We read recently where one angel in David's time killed over 700 soldiers. We read in other places where one angel destroyed an entire city. 
The angel who killed the 700 soldiers had turned his hand to Jerusalem and the Lord stopped him. If one angel can kill 700 soldiers, if one angel can destroy a whole city, what could 10,000 angels do? The earth would be reduced to a burned out cinder. And yet, we're not talking about the strength of an angel. We're talking about the strength of the creator of the angels. Leaning on the everlasting arms. The eternal God is thy refuge. Not a man, not an organization, not an angel, but the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath what? Underneath you. To hold you, to carry you like you'd carry your own dear child because you are the child of God. And Paul writes and says, if children, then heirs, the heirs of God. In verse 28, he says, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. Israel is going to be the, the nation that lasts for all time. A man asked me recently, I was a few weeks ago, I was uh, in another state, and a man asked me, he said, you know, I've noticed ever since Israel came into being, other people groups, other nations have tried to destroy Israel. And he says, why is there so much hatred against the Jewish people and against Israel? Well, I'm sure you could ask that question to many people and you'd get many different answers. And... Some people would say, well, other people are just evil. And some people say, well, they're just anti-Semites. But that doesn't really answer the question. That states fact, but doesn't answer the question. So I said to this man who said, why? Why have they always to this day and throughout history been trying to destroy Israel and the people of Israel? I said, well, think of this. Israel has been used to give us the Bible. He retorted and he said, the Bible was written by men. I said, Israeli men. I said, remember that. He stopped for a moment, thought about that. So through Israel, we have the Bible. We have the revelation of God. We have God's word. And then through Israel, we have the Messiah, the Savior. What if there was someone, some entity somewhere who didn't want the world to have the Bible and didn't want the world to have the Savior. Was there anybody like that? Well, of course there is. If you go back into Genesis and you'll find in chapters 3 how Satan comes to Eve and says, Yea, hath God said? Did God really speak? And if he spoke, did he really mean, do you really know what God said? In other words, do you really think you have the Word of God? Well, you do. But Satan would try to convince you that you have not the word of God. If you go to Revelation chapter 12 and then the early chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find that Satan tried to prevent the coming of the Savior, the Messiah, into the world. What if there was someone, and there is, who didn't want the world to have the Bible, the world to have the Savior, would not that person, that entity, want to destroy the source, the medium through which both of these things come, the Bible and the Savior, to destroy Israel? Well, preacher, your theory goes so far, but now we have the Bible and we have the Savior. Why destroy Israel now? Well, the Bible talks about Israel as being the nation that will last throughout all time and into eternity. By destroying Israel, you could prove that the Bible was not true. One of the greatest proofs that the Bible is the word of God is fulfilled prophecy. And all the prophetic uh, mentions of Israel and of other nations have come to pass. But if you destroy Israel, you can say, ha, your Bible was wrong. So yes, there is a conspiracy to destroy Israel. There is a human conspiracy to destroy Israel. There have been always, but there is a satanic conspiracy to destroy Israel. And yet verse 28 says, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob 
shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. What's he talking about? He's talking about a prosperous land, a beautiful land. I was talking to a lady last Tuesday who had been in Israel, had lived there, I think she said 11 years, and she said it's amazing how much they've turned the desert into farmland and how green and how prosperous the land is, like no other land around it. And then finally, we come to verse 29. There's a very, very essential phrase in verse 29 that I want you to focus on. Moses says in verse 29, Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee? And, and that's a good question. Who is like the nation of the people of Israel? And the answer is no one. They are unique and unique in a good way. Who is like unto thee? But watch this, O people saved by the Lord. Who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord? The shield of thy help, and who is the sword of his excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. What is he saying here? He says this, he says, happy art thou, O Israel, blessed, happy are thee. There's no one like thee, saved by the Lord. The Lord is the shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency? That's the Lord. And then it says, thy enemies shall be found liars unto thee. You know what? I'm a big believer in this. As the people of God, lest you and I let other people be the bad guys. Lest you and I let other people be the liars. Lest you and I be the best people that we can be. Lest you and I be the true people of God and exhibit what it's like to follow the Lord. Let somebody else do wrong. Let somebody else be the rebel. Let somebody else tell the lies. There are plenty of people out there willing to do it. Let them do it. You and I need to behave like the people of God. And then he says, thou shalt tread upon their high places, the houses of idolatrous worship. You'll read throughout the Old Testament of the high places, and those are altars built to the heathen idol gods. So it's tread upon those, the idolatrous worship. But I want to go back to the beginning of verse 29. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people of saved by the Lord. He's talking to people saved by the Lord. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other way. Peter says in Acts, he says, there's none other name given among, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What name is he talking about? The name of Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The only way you can be saved is to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, if you come to the Lord, go back to verse 27, you can claim the eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. When you've come to him by faith, when you've trusted in him, when he saved you, when you are among the people saved by the Lord. Well, say, you said earlier, this is talking about the tribe of Asher. It is, and it's talking about the people of Israel, but it's talking about anyone who will put their faith and trust in him. It's not about your physical heritage. It's not about what nation are you from. It's not about what language do you speak. It's not what, about the shade of your skin. It's about the condition of your heart and have you trusted in the Lord as your Savior. The Bible says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The Bible also says whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when you are the people saved by the Lord, then you can say the eternal God is my refuge. Then you can say underneath are the everlasting arms. Then you can say his strength cannot fail. His arms never tire. There is no God like him. And it's all true because you are the people saved by the Lord. Jesus said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
And what does he ask us to do? He asks us to believe. He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. It's the next phrase, the next verse. The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. You can rely upon him. You can rest in him when you put your faith in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for giving us the precious promises that you have. And Lord, help us to rest upon you, to rely upon you. Even in troublous times, Lord, you've said that you'd be our strength. And this morning we saw that we can abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, strengthen our faith, we pray. Help us to stand in that faith. Help us to trust in you and not our own strength. So many times, Father, we, we can't see the right way to go or know the right thing to do. But we can trust you. Now, Father, we come to the Towards the end of this service, Lord, we want to sing a hymn of invitation. We'll not ask people to come to the front as that wouldn't be practical in this hour. But right where they sit, let people open their heart. Let them call upon you. If there's one here who doesn't know you, may they open their heart and say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross and I trust you here and now to forgive me and to save me. Give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For those who do know you, Lord, let us pray. Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the everlasting God, the eternal God. You are my refuge, my strength. Let me lean upon your everlasting arms. Now, Father, bless and touch hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.